Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe. And I'm thrilled to welcome Jonathan Moore to the podcast today for the season premiere episode for the 1972 season, talking about The Night Stalker, which was a television movie premiered on television in January of 1972. How are we doing, Jonathan? Well, we're great because we're talking about one of my favorite things, TV movies. I actually really like TV movies. TV movies. We've talked like about two recently. We talked about Duel in November, and we mm -hmm. talked about Brian's song at the end of November. Duel was the better film by far. Also written by Richard Matheson, who wrote the teleplay to The Night Stalker. Had you seen The Night Stalker before? Yes. Okay. Have you seen everything that Dan Curtis touched? No, not everything. <laughs> no, but the Night Stalker is pretty. The Night Stalker is pretty famous because you know it, they have a two two TV movies and then they came out with it went to series uh, right. after the two TV movies. Yeah. So yeah, in my research, it looks like there was a TV movie sequel in seventy three, the Night and Strangler. then the Night Strangler. Which yeah. the way that the Night Stalker ends, I was curious. To, I'm like, I kind of want to see the next one. Yeah. Because it ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger. You don't really know what's going to happen to Kolchak and kind of his and next part of his enough, journey. It takes place up here in Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because so. Night Stalker is in it's Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. The next one is in Seattle. Yes. Oh, very cool. And there was going to be a third one. Yeah. There was going to be a third TV movie, but then they decided to make it a series. That's, is that right? That is correct. Okay, but this is the is this the first time we see Kolchak, the character in Night Stalker seventy two? That's the first time that yes. character shows up. Okay, yep. <laughs> you're and, you're one of my few guests where like I do my research, but then I ask your expertise. <laughs> I'm like, am I, but, I is that right, Jonathan? Am I right about that? <laughs> well, I'm glad that I'm on the episodes that I can do that for. You know? <laughs> so those of you who've been listening yeah. to the podcast for a while, we've had Jonathan on many times before. We've talked about. Uh, dark shadows twice we talked about house of dark shadows that was the first time you were on that was our halloween yes. episode in 2020 that was a really fun one if yeah. you haven't uh, listened to that or watched that check that out and then last year we did night of dark shadows the sequel and i had you on for a vincent price episode right abominable dr fives the abominable dr fives so it's, it's weird it's like i always have you on for films that have at least one sequel that comes out a year later Oh, <laughs> is it I, that? <laughs> maybe you're just planning in advance, Brian. <laughs> That's how we get Jonathan on like every three to five months. Is there's always a sequel that we can talk about, right? House of Dark Shadows, 1970, Night yep. of Dark Shadows, 71. Yep. And then we have Abominable Dr. Fibes, 71. Dr. Fibes rises, rises again. again, not rides, rises again, <laughs> 72. So we'll probably have you back for that. I think that came out, I think that came out in July of 72 yeah, something like that and the night stalker is 72 and then the sequel the night or yeah the night strangler is 73 73 yeah so what's up with that i don't know <laughs> i don't know brian maybe maybe we're just really good at this <laughs> we're just really good at this so yeah this is my season premiere episode for the 72 season oh, well, we are we are starting with this one because it premiered in january usually so the month of january i still finish off a few more episodes about films that came out the previous year so because this is airing in february i wanted to have this one be first since i try to keep it like to the week or at least a few weeks to when it when it came out or when it premiered on tv so we're starting with this one and then we're going into big films jonathan like cabaret what's up doc the godfather like some big oh, ones coming up here yeah so we're not starting with like one of the big ones <laughs> No, <laughs> going from the Night Stalker to Cabaret, a little bit different. But I just I looked this well, up. I, don't know. <laughs> I looked this up. So at first, I had not really heard of this movie when I was doing research for my episode about Brian Song last November. It said like Brian Song was the most watched TV movie ever until two months later when the Night Stalker premiered. And I went, oh, okay, so what is the Night Stalker? Why would that get more viewers for TV over Brian Song? And then I saw it was Richard Matheson. I saw it was Dan Curtis. I saw it was a vampire movie and it was set in Vegas. And I was like, oh, this could be really cool. So we're doing this one. <laughs> and I just watched it just today. 
had a good time with it. Very brief, 74 minutes. Yeah. It, are you sad it wasn't like two hours long? I think it was a good amount of time. I think it told a, <laughs> I, I think it, I think it told a good story, you know? Yeah. And uh, really, there's a lot actually to unpack mm-hmm. in this one because the last vampire film, I guess that would have happened previously to this would be House of Dark Shadows. Is that the, correct? The last vampire movie released in any way? Like prior to this. There was no vampire film in 71? Oh, or was there? Is it, was, was it the vampire? Uh, it well, I mean, didn't Night of Dark Shadows have vampires? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It didn't have any vampires? No, Brian. I don't remember. There were no I get that vampires. mixed up. <laughs> it's Dark Shadows. <laughs> There wasn't yeah, just like dark shadows doesn't mean they have vampires in it, Brian. I thought there was at least one. No. Okay. <laughs> there so was no vampire in Night of Dark Shadows. No, we talked. No, we talked about a seventy-one vampire movie. What well, was that? I wasn't, what, I wasn't what was on that, that called? Show. <laughs> it was. I wasn't uh, on the show, so it doesn't. Oh, count. it's escaping my mind. It we, we, we there was an October seventy-one release a vampire movie. It was it was not very good. My guest Forrest Hartman and I talked about it, and it was clearly so fantastic. I can't remember the title off the top of my head right now, but it was like it was like these two female vampires kind of preying on these other this couple that was staying at the hotel, and it was okay. It was it's probably one of the more famous horror films from seventy one. So talk um, and I'll look it up. <laughs> okay, yeah. So anyway, when when you think of that one, yeah. Uh, I think I think I know. I oh, think it's... I don't even have to look it up. It was called Daughters of Darkness. That's what it was called. Oh, the title just yeah. finally hit me. <laughs> have I, you seen I, that film? I I've not seen Daughters of Darkness. I've okay. heard of it, yeah, in passing, but I've not seen it. Yeah, so that that probably explains. Uh, there was a there was a list. I, I can't remember who put out the list. It was like the top 100 horror films of all time, and it was on that list. And that's mm-hmm. you know, I saw that ranking. I was looking at 71 horror films. I said, okay, I gotta talk about that one. And it was okay. It had some style, had, had some good performances. Yeah. But uh, I, I didn't think it was as good as the Dark Shadows films. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't speak much to that because I was thinking that the, the, the prior vampire film to uh, The Night Stalker was House of Dark Shadows. And so I don't know what happened in Daughters of Darkness. So you might have to correct me on that. You will but have then- to go. We, we, we talked about it on the podcast. You can go listen. I know I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but for the sake of this conversation, you're going to have to fill in some gaps for me. So, uh, no, there were other ones too. There was uh, Countess Dracula from 71. I didn't do an episode on that. That came out early in the year. There was the house of drip blood. I talked about on the podcast that had vampires in it. There's some vampire movies between was it, was it, house of dark Shadow. Okay, but that house of the house that drip blood was that, an all vampire one it's not all vampires no, but it's a it's an anthology horror film yeah. the last segment yeah. has vampires yeah. in it yeah that's what i was thinking yeah yeah so the last <laughs> full vampire film <laughs> we had talked about was house of dark shadows was house of dark shadows and so that's kind of where i wanted to take the discussion i wanted okay. to compare and contrast what we see in house of dark shadows to what we see in the night stalker because mm. a lot happened in two years yeah Actually. No, it's it's going to it's going to be really fun to watch the evolution of vampire movies throughout the 70s, getting yeah. us all the way to Salem's Lot, which you already said you would be my guest for in 2020. That's right. <laughs> and there's a sequel to that one, too. Yes. The return to Salem's Lot. But that was not a year later. That was 87. Yeah, I know. So we would have to talk about that one in 2037. So we're ways out on return to Salem's Lot. That's a lot closer than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> we would be older and wiser we talk well, about that beloved sequel i don't know if we'll be wiser <laughs> older for sure i can't imagine like i'm doing sequel. i can't imagine i'm doing this in 2037 be... i think you are you think i am yeah yeah oh man i'm just like i think you're doing this in 2070 <laughs> I can't do it in 2070 because then I'd be looking at the films of 2020 and with exactly. the pandemic, that's like a hard year to do the podcast on. You know, it's like, a how good do I... year to end it on. 
it's like <laughs> the year that the world ended and so that's the year that you know the podcast was i would be in my mid 80s if i did it then like i'm not that's... gonna be podcasting when i'm 85 <laughs> you don't know that maybe if i'm in good shape I mean, do you know this guy in this movie he was 70 years old right <laughs> and he was still doing all of these amazing things that everybody wants to do in their 70s. He was throwing people out windows. He was literally throwing people in swimming pools. He was abducting people. He was he was killing dogs that attacked him. I mean, you can do a lot <laughs> when you are part of the geriatric set, Brian. That's true. No, I'm not saying I wouldn't be up for it. I just don't know. Like, right now, I just want to get to Jaws. That's like the goal. That's 2025. We'll see how far we go after that. <laughs> I love the films of the 70s. So I, as long as I'm having a great time, I can see myself doing this through the 70s, the whole decade. And the 80s are also a lot of fun. Gosh, I don't know. You got to get, you got to get to Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> I got to get to Nightmare. Oh, I got to yeah. get to Halloween. I'm, I, the Halloween episode, like, like, how do I keep that under five hours? Like, that's going to be a tough one. Well, you can do a multi-part. All right, let's break it down. We would break it down shot by shot. <laughs> or I could just get like a really great guest for like 30 minutes and just call it a day. Just have that be the episode. <laughs> oh, I don't think you- Get Jamie I don't Lee think on. You, I'd, oh, well, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you could do that. But I think you'd still want to talk about it more. <laughs> Probably, yeah, it's just like a five minute interview, like three questions and then, okay, there's my Halloween episode. <laughs> All right, so you want to, that's interesting. You want to compare the Night Stalker to House of Dark Shadows. Yeah. Uh, so before we get to anything, let me let me just break down the, the basic plot of the movie. So it's an, about an abrasive Las Vegas newspaper reporter named Kolchak, played by Darren McGavin, who investigates a series of murders he believes, not everyone does, but he believes have been committed by a vampire. And there's a lot of talk in this movie about vampires and some of the other detectives and the cops. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he's like, no, this is definitely a vampire. <laughs> and that's just kind of the, I mean, it's a very, very simple premise. It's like a detective on the case and bodies pile up and he knows that it's a vampire, but not everyone believes him. And it, of course, takes us to a giant spooky house in the last 20 minutes which, which is like a Dan Curtis, film. a Dan Curtis staple. I'm like, okay, we're going to get a creepy house, right? And there it is. I said, okay, it's definitely Curtis. <laughs> He's a part of this production. It was really weird hearing Bob Cobert's music while looking at Las Vegas. <laughs> it we was talked really about, it's surreal. We talked about Diamonds Are Forever recently. And, and one thing that we both loved, my guests and I both loved about watching that movie was just watching like Vegas early 70s location footage yeah. is really fun so that was a great part of night stalker too is to see early 70s vegas always really great uh you mentioned the music i, I would and this was a problem with the brian song episode too the music of these tv movies is terrible did you like the music in the night night stalker i thought that music in the night stalker was was pretty good I mean, really? it's Bob Cobert. Like, we remember we talked about how much we liked his music before. We did. <laughs> yeah. For, for what? For Night of Dark Shadows. House of Dark Shadows. Night of Dark Shadows. Yeah. The part at the end when he's in the house, the music is pretty solid. But there are parts yeah. of this movie where it sounds like I'm watching the Batman from '66. Well, and yeah. It's, and it's supposed to be a scary horror. <laughs> well, Detective I movie. Mean, that's because you're trying to, you know, strike this. I think it was just weird because, you know. Cobert for Dan Curtis mostly did really gothic mm. trappings, like you know, right? And then you have to have a sound that right. works for that sort mm -hmm. of story in Las Vegas too, mm -hmm. when he'd been mostly you know composing music for spooky movies in the 1800s or like in small little towns and mm -hmm. big haunted houses. And so I think that was part of a part of the challenge, but. There were certain themes and motifs that carried through. Um, and then you had to write a, a, a song for the Kolchak character uh, himself, mm -hmm. which I think uh, was kind of challenging considering the kind of guy he is and the subject matter he's dealing mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, I, I think an interesting thing, but I think that, uh, you know, as far as the spooky score, which is the only score I care about, 
Um, yeah. I think that it was it was very good. Yeah. Interesting. I wanted it to be spookier. There's a part where he's talking about vampires yeah. early in the movie, and the music is like bouncy, like you're watching a comedy. And I'm like, what's happening right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, the character of Kolchak like... is an interesting character, mm -hmm. and I think the music uh, sort of delves into that a little bit mm -hmm. because he's he's odd. He wants to be taken as this really serious reporter, right? He wants to make it big. He wants to have his byline. You know, mm -hmm. he cares about he cares about getting information out to people too, mm -hmm. right? So he cares about his job as a journalist, but he also cares about taking pictures. Taking pictures, but he cares <laughs> about he cares about wanting to get back. Like this mm. is a guy that's kind of like down and out. Yeah, so he's yeah, he's complaining about his assignment at the beginning. He's like, come on, give me something better than this. He seems yep. he's kind of like at the bottom of the rung at the beginning. Yep. And at, at the end, he's so confident. He's walking around. He's like, yeah, I just solved this murder and yep. I'm feeling good. So, yeah, he's he's he wants to be at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he and if you like look into the, the script a little bit, um, you can see that he obviously had come from, you know, many different places. He'd been all over. You know, he get, keeps getting fired from jobs or something and keeps ending up in these different places, probably mm -hmm. because he ends up in situations like this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so let's go through a little bit of research I found here. So uh, the film was written by Richard Matheson. He also wrote Duel, of course, a very famous novelist, too. He wrote one of my favorite books, I Am Legend, which has become a bunch of movies. Uh, so Duel aired just two months prior to this in November of 71. I don't know why Duel wasn't a bigger hit like on TV that, over the Night Stalker or Brian's song. I think Duel is by far the best of the three films, but that's interesting. The film was directed by John Llewellyn Moxie, who had directed mostly TV, like The Saint, Mission Impossible, and Murder, She Wrote. The last credit he has is like Murder, She Wrote, 1991. Uh, the film was produced by Dan Curtis, who made the Dark Shadows television series and the movies along with 1976's Burnt Offerings, which I still have not seen yet, but it looks really interesting. I watched the trailer. He also directed, produced many TV movies. His last project was as a consulting producer on the Night Stalker TV series, which aired from 2005 to 2006, starring Stuart Townsend as Col Kolchak. Do you know anything about the 2005 series? Yeah, I, yeah I've seen uh, some of the episodes of the 2005 series. The interesting thing is that this was a series on ABC. Okay. And they only own the rights to this movie mm -hmm. and its sequel, the, the TV movie. So but ABC not the TV series. Did not own the TV series because okay. Universal owns the rights to the TV series. Mm -hmm. So, and then Universal's TV series was renamed four episodes in as Kolchak the Night Stalker. So ABC went with the name The Night Stalker for the, this revival series okay. uh, in the mid 2000s, and um, it it was so it was allegedly a remake of this movie, right? Okay. But there's no that I can recall. There's no vampires or anything in it. It's it's sort of like what the Universal owned series is like, which is was like a very early X Files. Mm. And the interesting thing is that when uh, they were trying to create the X-Files, right, and they were trying to um, put that on air, uh, Darren McGavin was asked to resurrect the character of Carl Kolchak. In the X-Files? Yes. In like, supposed, like early in, in the show? In the, yes, but like before the show started, he was in... Uh, they wanted. They were trying to negotiate to have him play Kolchak in the series. Oh, that's so weird. He would be Does that happen very often? Universe. Does it that did. happen very often where there's like a character in a bunch of movies and then that character shows up in a show that's not his show? <laughs> no, but <laughs> I think that I think it was like a sort of an attempt to resurrect uh, the character of Carl, Carl Kolchak. Uh, Kolchak is a really popular guy mm -hmm. with um, a very particular set of the general public mm. like they he's 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 really like big like a lot of people will have fond memories of like dark shadows or star trek and then mm. there's a there's a big number of people that actually have very fond memories of carl kolchak they just love kolchak mm -hmm. they think he's just this phenomenal character and he, so he's he's quite popular 
with this certain subset of has there uh, ever been a film or show called just Kolchak? <laughs> it's Kolchak? always Kolchak. No, no. Okay, so Kolchak, it's... the Night Stalker. That's the name of the series from the seventies. Mm-hmm. And then the one in the 05 is the Night Stalker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's hard to keep it all together. And then and then there's the X Files. But the X Files. Kolchak yeah. ever make an appearance never, on the X Files? No, no, because Darren McGavin uh didn't said that he did not want to to bring the character back. Okay. Um for the X Files. So he played uh another character instead. Yeah. So apparently the series, Darren McGavin came back for the series, but the but the reason why it got canceled was that he was he asked to be released from his contract. He was tired of playing the character. Is that right? You mean the original culture? I mean, the original 70s, like the series could have gone on longer, but he wanted out. He was disappointed with the series scripts. He was kind of over the character and wanted out. So they canceled. That makes sense. I, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure why the the series itself was canceled. But if that's what you're. But I don't think it went very long. I don't. Like no, it was only a few uh, episodes. Twenty episodes. Twenty, 20 episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like it ran for five years or something, and then he was like, "I'm done." It's like some of these yeah. actors who were on a show for, you know, they're on year nine, and they're like, "Can I get out?" <laughs> like I'm done. <laughs> that happens. I think sometimes. it. Was, I think it was sort of like a, a Peter Falk type thing with Columbo. Columbo. You know, where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Columbo has a very specific like there's like a certain like standard mm-hmm. in order for for something to be like a Columbo episode like you know you have really high expectations from it mm-hmm. and that's why Columbo was not a weekly series that's why you know it was just this long series of basically television movies mm-hmm. throughout the 1970s and then resurrected in the the 80s and through the 90s and early 2000s um but i think that that might have had a part in it where um you go from producing, you know, pretty, you know, well thought out, uh, well executed uh, films with, you know, a, a pretty high standard, right? Mm-hmm. Especially for television. And then going to a weekly series, you know, with a reduced budget. And then you have to have, you know, a storyline mm-hmm. every week and things along those lines. So that might have played a part in that, um, where there's just that difference between having a TV movie and then having a, a, a running series right yeah i mean i i feel like at the time if there was enough popularity with this character it made sense to go to a series and not just have it be a bunch of tv movies like at, at some point i think you, it becomes a series because they know that they can get more out of it rather than just a yearly tv movie yeah but uh i think that maybe if they had followed sort of what they did with Columbo, where you know you have you know, a, a rotation, the mystery wheel mm-hmm. where, you know, they have the Columbo movie, you know, like once a month or once every other month. And then you mm-hmm. got, you know, all of these different, you know, Quincy and, yep. and all of the other ones that, that, that play into it. I think that they probably would have had more success with Darren McGavin and keeping him in the role. Mm. Yeah. He probably, when it went to series and it became probably his whole life, he was just, that's all he was doing for a few months. He probably was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Some actors, I think they don't like that. Some actors love that. The steady paycheck every week, they know what they're doing. I know a lot of actors really enjoy that. I think some actors prefer to mix it up and not just do one thing for too long. So that might've been the issue with him. Uh, so let's see some other trivia here. According to Dan Curtis, the film was shot for $450,000. Filming was completed in only 12 days for the Night Soccer. These TV movies, they're filmed really quickly. I think mm-hmm. Duel, Spielberg talks about on the DVD bonus feature interview, I think he had, I think it was like 12 days that like he shot that whole movie. And he said it was like impossible. He, he doesn't know today how he did it. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, because they're like, they shoot them really quickly and they edit really quickly. And then boom, it's on, yep. it, it's, it's airing. Sometimes it's like two or three months prior. That's when they're getting started. It's like, it's not like a year like they shoot it and then a year later it's airing happens very quickly uh while filming in vegas dan curtis was amazed at how oblivious the casino gamblers were to any events going on around them other than gambling uh so as a joke one day actor barry atwater was asked to walk through the sahara's casino in full costume and makeup to see if anyone would notice him he did this for over 40 minutes and did not get a single second glance from any of the gambling <laughs> i don't know how true that story is but i want to believe it it's pretty funny well it says so it says it says a great deal about the people of las vegas <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see that 
<laughs> like if you're gambling and you're on hour seven and you're like into, like you're not going to notice some weird guy walking by with vampire makeup on i mean you know half of the people that go to las vegas probably look like that anyway <laughs> But I like I like that Dan Curtis has a sense of humor. I, I have not like watched an interview with him. I, I'm not quite sure what his demeanor is like. It sounds like he might have been more of a goofball than I thought. Like he has a sense of humor about he's a pretty stuff. down to earth guy. Yeah. Down to earth. Yeah. Right? He's 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 a bit of um he has very high standards, right? Mm. For himself, like and you know, what he wants and 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 so I think that uh but I think that the people that um, have worked with him, you know, talk about his professionalism, you know, his, his high standards, you know, he's, he kind of uh, really pushes people very hard and works them very hard. Uh -huh. um, but I think that uh, there is a soft side uh, to that as well. So. Right. So that I thought that was interesting. Uh, I read that the music from House of Dark Shadows from 1970 was used toward the end, noteworthy since Kolchak and Bernie Jenks are fighting uh, Jan Janos. Is that his name? Janos. The vampire ja Janos. 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 It's ja Janos. I think Janos, Janos in the vampire's house. So there is music from House in Night Stalker. Well, is that there true? Isn't. No, there's not. There's it, so the the music or like from a House version is, of it. Well, I so a lot of Coburn's themes. Mm. If you listen to all of his work, um, they have similar motifs, right? Oh, okay. And so there's not kind of similar. necessarily there's so there's no direct music uh, from House of Dark Shadows in this film. Okay, nothing was lifted. Uh, that no, I do not. I did not hear anything lifted directly from the score. So who House wrote this? Shadows. Who wrote this piece of research? They're just lying to us. Well, I mean, <laughs> there are certain like cues and cues. motifs okay. that. Cobert would use frequently okay. um and so sort of you know similar arrangements and so uh, the tune i noticed tunes that were very similar to what you heard in the dark shadows movies mm. uh, and they would so this musically the the really dark music here would would fit very well with you know other dark shadows projects mm -hmm. but um there's nothing that is directly from the film House of Dark Shadows, at least that was used in House of Dark Shadows. Okay, interesting. In, in so maybe it's just maybe it's just they're similar and, and yeah, uh, they are. They're, they're, there is a lot of similarity. Yeah, I mean the t like the tone of that scene, like there, I, I did see similarities between House and then this movie at the end with yeah. walking through the, the dark house the, and the vampire. But, but the music in House of Dark Shadows uh, was a lot better. Hmm then oh in yeah that, in the in the climax scene like i mean it's it's really super memorable right and then here it's 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 spooky it has atmosphere but it's definitely not as memorable as mm. the the climactic music in house right so at a test screening the audience reaction was so positive that dan curtis regretted not releasing it as a theatrical feature film so do you think they made the right call making this a 75 minute tv movie or do you think this should have been like a hour 40 theatrical movie like just added I, some scenes and made it a theatrical film so that's kind of where we get into this discussion of how you handle vampires mm. right so you start off in you know 1922 with nosferatu right and really 100 gothic. years ago wow i can't even believe it yeah it's just 100 years just insane i, I think it i think, think i i that until you said that it, uh, I believe it had its first screening in February of 1922, which would be exactly 100 years ago this month. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought about doing wow. Nosferatu as a bonus episode, yeah. but I've, my life's gotten really crazy lately and yeah. I've just, I had to let go of something. <laughs> so uh, well, bonus, ep bonus episodes are kind of on hold right now. If I, down the road, if I get a little bit more free time, <laughs> I might do some more bonus episodes. But uh, Nosferatu, yeah, a hundred years ago, yeah. the, the, so, like the kind of the birth of not the birth of vampire cinema. Obviously, there's some films that came before that, but it's one that the first like really memorable vampire movie we all know. So I think that um, when you think of vampires through the 1920s, through you know Dracula, Lugosi Dracula. in the 1930s, uh, Dracula's daughter, uh, all the way up, you know through 
until the Hammer films. And then you got the, the Hammer series going pretty strong uh, in the 50s and the 60s. There's, and then Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. Vampires are in a very particular place mm. in the setting. It's, it's in a very particular setting. So you obviously, you know, they're in some foreign uh, castle uh, in uh, Eastern Europe in the early films, uh, Hammer films too. Mm. Uh, Dark Shadows brings vampires to America with uh, Barnabas Collins. Uh, of course, that happened prior to that in a few other films as well. Mm -hmm. um, most notably, but probably not all that well executed with Lon Chaney Jr., in the son of dracula oh, no. um and so that was that took place in the antebellum south uh okay yeah lon so, cheney jr played didn't he play the wolfman frankenstein's wolfman. monster and dracula yes, he, at some point yes, he, he did all he three was the, he was the only actor uh to to play all three characters in the universal right uh, which series. one did he play frankenstein's monster in? do you know so lon cheney would have played frankenstein's monster in ghost is that ghost okay yes in ghost of frankenstein with lugosi playing uh igor igor is lugosi in that okay yeah they so should have igor... made they should have made a film where he played all three in the same movie like it was like yeah. lon chaney like you know cut cut to dracula cut to <laughs> wolfman and then, it's and, all and of course he and of course he played the mummy too oh he played the mummy too what and what what did he play the mummy in oh he well so he was the most he's the most well-known uh mummy so you've got um so Karis and the mummy well, Kar karloff is more well known right in the 1932 mummy well so that's the interesting thing about the universal monsters is that you've got really famous movies right mm -hmm. but then you have how does the public perceive these characters right and so most of the public perception of the characters is grounded in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein mm. because it was the final installment in the Universal Monsters series. You know, the, the, the that's considered the final three. installment. There yeah, was so House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and then Abbott and Costello is the one that's considered the last one. Yeah. So the that is the series. Yeah. So that's the, okay. the last in the official series. Um, for a while, there were a group of people, there was a group of people that did not. Uh, include uh, Abbott and Costello in the pantheon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of been discounted. So it's 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 officially within the the Universal Monsters universe. Well, and creature so, creature from the Black Lagoon is yes, also considered. Yes, that was fifty four, right? Well, of course, yes. But I'm talking about with those monsters. You're talking about with specifically with like Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster, Dra Dracula, monster Dracula, and the Wolfman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all of those monsters. That is the official end of their story. Mm -hmm in that film right that's where they all ended and then you go to you know creature from the black lagoon uh this island earth you know all sorts of other uh universal monsters uh, that happened after that but didn't abin casello meet the mummy isn't that a movie yes yes <laughs> was that yes. after or before yeah it was after that yeah. was after okay but that's Costello... not a, that's not considered part of the okay well, it is, I suppose, it's it's considered part of the Mummy series. Because this, you're, you're talking about not the Mummy, you're talking about just Frankenstein's Monster, Dracula, I was just Dracula, talking about Wolfman. Frankenstein, Dracula. And they Wolfman. are separate from the Mummy. Okay. No, but <laughs> in terms of like their story. So like if the first Frankenstein film in the Universal series is Frankenstein 31. The right. last is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Right. The first Dracula Frankenstein. film, you know, is Lugosi 1931. The last Dracula film is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Wolfman, Wolfman 41. 41. Well, there was one in the 30s called Werewolf of London. Is Where, that yeah, considered? 1933. But that's not part 36. of the Wolfman. That's not part 30, of it. 36, okay. yeah. Sorry, 36, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. we consider Wolfman just 41 to 48. That's the Wolfman, yeah. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, you've got Henry Hole playing, the, you know, the werewolf of London. Yeah. And then you yeah. get into the Hammer films of the 50s and 60s, and that's yeah. a whole other thing. Yeah. That's a whole other thing, yeah. But anyway, I don't even know where we were going. With it. <laughs> but it... <laughs> okay. Yeah, try to, let's going try to, back to bring it back. back. Well, going back to the, the Universal films. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's... that. Yes, this is a tangent, and then I'll wrap <laughs> this tangent up and okay. then go back to another tangent. 
So the Universal <laughs> films are sort of interesting because you've got um, people that perceive the characters to be one thing, and they were perceived that way because of the marketing mm. of the Universal monsters in the 1950s, 1960s, you know, the great monster kid generation. So boomers, people that grew up as baby boomers, uh, grew up with certain visions, you know, interpretations of what these monsters looked like. Mm -hmm. And Lon Chaney Jr. was the only person to ever play the Wolfman. So when we think of the Wolfman, we think of Lon Chaney Jr. When we think of Frankenstein's monster, now you would probably say Boris Karloff, right? I would. But a, a lot of people <laughs> that grew up in the um, 50s and 60s, they don't think of Karloff. Yeah, he's there. Mm -hmm. But they really, what comes to mind for them is Glenn Strange, who played the monster in House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and uh, Abinus Tello Meet Frankenstein, because he was the most recent Frankenstein monster. And then Bela Lugosi, you know, of all the terrible things that ever happened to him with Universal, this actually turned out rather well for him okay. because he was able to reprise the role of Dracula in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And it was a huge part of the film. Dracula is basically the monster in the film. Right. Yeah. And so he was able to cement his legacy mm -hmm. as Dracula for that entire generation because mm -hmm. of that movie. Right. And so um, when you think about the mummy now going back to the mummy, it's not Karloff that people would have thought of in that particular generation, which sort of defined the oh, universal right. monsters. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually Lon Chaney Jr. playing a uh, Karis. Mm -hmm. So he's not playing. Uh, so it's not it's not Karloff as Imhotep. It's, oh, it's Lon okay. Chaney Jr. as Karis. Mm -hmm. And so he was sort of the the monster kid generation mummy. Right. And so that it's sort of interesting because all the marketing, all of the masks, you know, the famous monsters of Filmland magazine, all of the model kits, the Aurora model kits, they they depicted Glenn Strange, they depicted Lon Chaney Jr., they depicted Bela Lugosi. Mm -hmm. So that that's just how the monsters were cemented in in, in our minds. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as years went on and then monsters became less of, you know, something for kids and teenagers, and they became more, you know, oh, this is like everybody's liking you know the classic monsters now and then people start looking at the original films the original frankenstein the original dracula and, and then they sort of like oh yeah well frankenstein's boris karloff right and mm -hmm. then a lot of what was developed over the course of the 50s and 60s you know sort of went went away um and then there's a whole bunch of and this is why films are really messy because you know all of the likeness rights and 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 you know who owns you know copyrights on different things and who can use actors likenesses you know that was never scripted out mm -hmm. in those contracts right and so then a bunch of legal matters came about and so now universal can really only use as boris karloff because of some series of lawsuits and settlements uh to as the frankenstein monster so there's not a lot of products that come out featuring glenn strange anymore mm. uh, but he was still very prominent in products up through through the 1990s uh, there was Glenn Strange that was used even in the early 2000s on a bag at uh, Jack in the Box for the kids' hmm. toys, kids' meal toys. Yeah, because I, I mean, I grew up no. in the 90s, really. No. And when I was getting into horror films in the 90s, I sought out all the old monster movies from Universal. And it was always Karloff for me. I, I, I don't have any memory of like, of thinking about Glenn Strange as Frankenstein's monster. No, like, yeah. Maybe no. I saw that film, but. But, but, but the image that you saw was you know on on things what was glenn strange unless they the people had to pay actual you know additional fees to use the, the karloff image starting in the the mid 90s mm -hmm. um, about 1997 or so uh there was a lot of glenn strange that would still appear mm -hmm. and lon cheney jr that would appear uh as frankenstein monster like if you're gonna go and buy a box of cookies and you're getting universal monster cookies or something or mm -hmm. you know going to get a kids meal toy or something uh so marketing towards kids still actually really did not have a lot of boris karloff mm -hmm. uh it wasn't until uh 1997 when the united states post office you know sort of had that great resurrection of the universal monsters that karloff sort of came back and mm -hmm. that he you know sort of was back as the the official 
uh, Frankenstein monster. And, and in the products, uh, Hasbro made some, some 12 inch action figures and they used the Karloff likeness. And so he appeared on the box. And then uh, in the uh, Sideshow Toys, which has probably up, had up until probably this past year when um, NECA was, is now releasing a line of user, Universal Monsters, they uh, actually had the really cool, uh, probably the ultimate Universal Monsters uh, collection mm. of toys. And they all used um, Boris Karloff in, in, in most of the, the products that, that they used to. Oh, cool. So, so yeah, so that kind of explains the marketing of the Universal Monsters. Mm -hmm. And then we went on this tangent about Karis, and I don't know quite why we went on that tangent, but <laughs> we sure did. I was I was waiting for your your chat there, Jonathan, to lead us back into Night Stalker. I didn't quite find that yeah. thread. <laughs> yeah, no, we we this was all about Karis because you were talking about the mummy. It came up because we were talking about the mummy. Oh, okay. I thought you were t you were talking about the history of like vampires in films, and you were oh, gonna like lead us. You, you were yeah. gonna lead us yeah, toward the Night Stalker. Now. Yeah, let's do that now. The title of the episode is the Night Stalker. Yeah, I understand that, Brian. But you know, <laughs> we never stick to what they're telling us to stick to. I, I go one last one last question about the mummy. Uh, oh yeah. Do you enjoy the Tom Cruise version? You know, there, it has its fans. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. You know dismiss something that people like and if they they go to the classics my favorite mummy film is the boris karloff original i i think it's a phenomenal film yeah the best I, scene I, of any mummy movie is that opening scene where he's dressed up as the yep. mummy like that scene is great i know, I know. and so i think and, I think and there's a lot of people that think that the original mummy is just too slow and you know they yeah, kind of knock it i think but I, I really think it's a great film. I think it was really well done. I I think I I really love the yeah, movie. That's I love one of my favorite horror films movies. of like the early to mid thirties. I just love that period yeah. of horror. It's so cool. So anyway, Night, gothic, Night Stalker. Gothic trappings. <laughs> gothic trappings. Okay. So you've got, you know, all of this sort of gothic atmosphere in all of these vampire films. Well, now all of a sudden Cold Chaff, the Night Stalker, brings vampires into not only the modern world because mm -hmm. dark shadows brought vampires into like the modern world and right. modern day america right mm -hmm. um but it brings it into a pretty major city in mm. the united states right yeah and so that you get this whole political angle that for mm -hmm. example in dark shadows never would have come up because you know it's just like a a one share of town you know that's dealing with you know, this, these people going missing or people, you know, dealing with all of this, uh, you know, murder or people mm -hmm. getting attacked and things along those lines. And so there was never really a political aspect. And the tourism aspect, I think, plays a big part in the story, too, with Las mm -hmm. Vegas. And the original writer of the story, which I don't know if we've talked about this yet, the original writer of the story, because if you, you know, you read the opening credits. Yeah, it's, it's not Matheson. He adapted a, yeah. an unpublished story. Is an that what the credits unpublished story, said? yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the credits said an unpublished story. And the author of this story uh, was able to get the book published after the film aired. But oh, okay. he had to wait until they made the sequel to okay. do that so that the publishing house could release the Night Stalker and the Night Strangler, uh, Strangler is number one and two. Oh, okay. On their their list of uh, publishing for that that year. Was it a, then, what is it a story or a book? It's a book. It was a book. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, so he was able to get the book published um, after the TV movie. I think that helps and when the TV it, it movie. Definitely, definitely. As helps. my last piece of trivia here, at the time of its original airing on January eleventh, nineteen seventy two. The Night Stalker was the most widely viewed TV movie ever with a 33.2 rating and a 54 share. So why do we think that it was the most watched TV movie ever? What about Night Stalker drew in all these viewers? I think there was, well, there's a couple of different pieces to it. Uh, I think that, you know, the name Dan Curtis still had a lot of mm. pull and had mm -hmm. a lot of weight. For you say Dark this Shadow. is a Dan, a Dan Curtis production, right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, Bob Cobert, the music of Robert Cobert, that had a lot of weight. 
mm-hmm. right? Because um, of Dark Shadows and Quentin's theme, you know, Shadows of the Night, you know, going on the billboard. And so there were there were some big, big names mm-hmm. uh, that were attached to this project. And it it actually was a pretty interesting project because Dark Shadows is relatively tame Mm -hmm. by comparison which is one thing that i i wanted to talk about like how the vampires in the kolchak universe are so much more aggressive aggressive like that scene at the car with the dog and the woman yeah yep and it's 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 really sort of an action-packed film right where dark shadows is this i don't know i don't know if i'd go that far (laughs) You don't think it's an action? I would not film? call the I would not call the Night Stalker action packed. I mean, there's oh a lot God, of scenes I... of people sitting in rooms talking. Oh my God, Brian! <laughs> I think this is there's too much action in here for there's me. Too much action for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say there are scenes and... of intensity and action. There's not. I mean, there's there are stretches of action scenes. <laughs> there, there are like, stretches of this movie where not a lot's happening. Well, I mean, just think about just think for about seventy-four the people. Minutes. People thinking in in 1972, they're sitting in their their television, and they hadn't been exposed to like you know the A team yet. They hadn't been right. exposed to all of these you know. We're you looking know, at this through a 2022 lens of yeah. Marvel movies, and yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah, this like is, this if is you're, super action packed. You got to trust me on seen this. Seen like three, if you've seen like three action movies in your life in January 72, like maybe this movie, The Night Stalker, could be action packed. Yeah. Maybe. It's super action packed. You got to trust me on this. No, because I, 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 I is I was as somebody who lives in 1972. I got to tell you, there's a lot of action in this film, um, especially for TV. Like, right? Oh, yeah. For for like, yeah, for a TV movie of the week, yeah. there's probably more action in this than in a lot of other films. But I yeah. still wouldn't call it action packed. That's a very specific word. It's action packed for me. <laughs> like. Commando is action packed with Schwarzenegger, <laughs> not the Night Star. <laughs> See, I, I don't, I don't watch action movies, Brian. Oh, so well, there you go. Is, this is, this is, this is action. <laughs> A lot of so, action yeah. So movies. let's let's dig into the movie. That's all my research. Did you have anything else you wanted to share about like history of the film or the making of the movie? That's those are all the pieces of trivia I found. No, I think uh, I think we covered everything? a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's more, but I, I think th- those are some of the highlights, yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, at the end, we'll talk about Dan Curtis's career a little bit more in depth. But so, yeah, what are your thoughts on the Night Stalker besides the fact that you think it's very action-packed? What I else do. did you, <laughs> what else did you well, enjoy about this? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on all of the action and sort of like <laughs> how this, this, you know, it's weird because up until this point, vampires are very reserved Mm -hmm. right and they and it's and 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 the film is sort of very out about this too like Mm -hmm. kolchak makes you know these remarks about vampires you know in dinner in dinner jackets and you know uh you know bela lugosi has attacked again right so yeah it's it's very self-aware of the genre Mm -hmm. which makes this an interesting film and that's kind of what i wanted to 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 focus on Kolchak like knows his stuff about vampires. Like he, he's read up on them. <laughs> well, I mean, he, 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 you know, he's introduced to him by you know his girlfriend or whatever, right? But I mean, he, 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 <laughs> he's, he's acting like a sort of blue collar, modern day in the nineteen seventies guy. Right, very act. contemporary of its time. Yeah, if mm-hmm. if somebody you know we're talking about vampires, he's. And everybody else around him is like, oh, my God, crazy vampires. And, and then, you know, he he sort of has this thing. Well, it might be somebody pretending to be a vampire. Oh, maybe it's an actual vampire, right? Mm. And so, he, you know, he's sort of on the fence there for a while. And the movie deals with this issue of how do you deal with a vampire in 1972, mm-hmm. which I think it's it holds up pretty well. Mm-hmm. how would you deal with a vampire in 2022 <laughs> i I, okay. think it, I think it does because you know if wherever cross sunlight <laughs> well no but Stick i think to the how, heart how does a city deal with a vampire like how what is the you know the, the ramifications of a vampire so you know you're walking down the street 
and then all of these types of murders start happening, right? And, you know, in Dark Shadows, it's like, oh, well, there's – nobody ever says it's a vampire in the original TV series. Nobody mm. ever says it's a vampire at all. Yeah. They just think that women are getting attacked and, you know, mm -hmm. people are going missing and things along those lines. And they just discount the idea that a vampire exists. And then you bring in, you know, <laughs> yep. a, a scientist or whatever. And the Kolchak, it's, it's very – everybody is discounting the idea that a vampire exists. And rather than have a scientist that wants to go in and sort of like figure out, you know, the science of vampires, mm -hmm. you got a guy that's just like, no, I think this is a real honest to goodness vampire. <laughs> that's right. And we need to deal with this yeah. right now. You know, we got to take care of it. We don't want to, we don't want to cure him. We don't want to, we don't want to help him out. We just want to kill this guy. Yeah. And then the, doesn't him. the boss, like they say, well, that would be homicide. You can't just kill him. Well, yeah. I mean, and then you got, <laughs> then you got, you know, the end of the film, which I know. Then the end, which about, we'll, but... no, we'll talk about, we're going to okay. talk about the ending. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that. But yeah, let's kind of touch on the first part of the movie. Any, anything else we like in like the first half? So uh, again, I have, I'm a very particular type of movie watcher. Mm -hmm. So when I'm sitting down, I think that there was, you know, everything was perfectly fine. The Las Vegas setting is, is, is cool. It's interesting. It's, it's fun to see Las Vegas in this particular mm -hmm. time period. You know, yeah. you see Binion's horseshoe and, and all of that other stuff in there. And so I think there's a lot of cool components to it. And then you've got the character of Kolchak himself, who is a really unique guy. Really great and, character. I enjoyed him yes. in this. Darren yes. McGavin's performance. Like he was yes. very likable, but not, he wasn't like overly goofy or he was just like a, a nice character to spend time with. I, I enjoyed yes. him. And so I think he's very relatable too. I think that mm -hmm. McGavin uh, uh, made him extremely uh, relatable. So um, there's really, I think that it, it does a really decent job of uh, laying out the foundation of, you know, where this is taking place, what the atmosphere is. The idea of having him be a journalist, having this main character be a journalist, mm -hmm. you know, a newspaper writer. And you get all those fun little remarks because he's, he's not, he is he's a guy that calls it how he sees it mm -hmm. and i think that's why you know maybe a lot of people connected to him because he was very honest and very straightforward and you know he there's an as you know somebody who has been a journalist me you know you mm -hmm. hear a lot of things that he says that uh actually ring true and he's talking about you know <laughs> newspaper journalists at the time and they still do this today though there's not too many of them anymore mm -hmm. uh you know they always make fun of the the people that do radio and tv you know, I'm a TV journalist, so uh, I always get made fun of by the newspaper guys. But, you know, and then he's doing the same stuff in the movie. So it's well written. It's 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 actually, you know, true to life from from a, a journalistic perspective, uh, you know, not necessarily in, in and out. But, you know, there's mm. there's stuff like that would that rings very true. And so it's relatable. The character himself is relatable. The way he's played is super relatable. Mm -hmm. And he, he's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. one character yeah the, the one quote i wrote down from the movie i enjoyed was when he says gentlemen i hate to say this but it looks like we have a real genuine vampire on our hands <laughs> i was like that's that is going in the notebook <laughs> <laughs> like how, how, what what would you say to that jonathan if someone said that to you i'd say, say let's go I, find I, him. I, let's go find, <laughs> let's go find him <laughs> let's the adventure begins that's right now, I mean, I, I, watching I, I this movie, I don't want to get my dog killed, but I mean, you know. <laughs> watching this movie, I was like, would it be better? Would it be worse? Would it be the same if there wasn't the vampire aspect? If it was just a serial killer, like, would it be? I, I feel like it wouldn't work towards the end. That's where I think having it be a vampire makes the movie so much more interesting. So I'm happy they went that route. But it it is so it feels so much of it feels so real, the setting and it feels very 71, 72 and. It, there's nothing very gothic about the movie. Maybe a little bit at the end in that house. But yes, the end, yeah. As you were saying, it's not, doesn't have like, there's not a lot of like fog and, you know, like that mm -hmm. attack scene where the woman brings the dog out of her car and the dog attacks the vampire and then he just like discards the dog very quickly and, and approaches her. Like that felt very, that felt more of like a creepy 70s realistic attack scene versus something we might have gotten in the 60s like that's what, yeah, a little bit more gothic and fog and all that yeah that's what that's what i'm talking about you know this is just an abrupt departure yeah from vampires from two years prior mm -hmm. you know this is a 
an extremely abrupt departure from the character of Barnabas Collins. Yeah, it's, in the it's, 60s, right? It's a lot of like stuffy kind of historical films with vampires, whereas yeah. now in the 70s, we're starting to get a little bit more dangerous contemporary films with, yeah. with the vampire characters, yeah. So like House of Dark Shadows elevated the violence of mm-hmm. Barnabas Collins from the TV series, right? And you've got that whole yeah. stalking of Daphne scene, you know, he's following her to the car, which is still very frightening mm-hmm. uh, in my the eyes. <laughs> that close-up of the eyes really great well no i'm talking about in house of dark shadows oh you're talking about house of dark shadows sorry yeah house of dark shadows you know mm-hmm. going up you know the progression of vampires from you know 1967 um, to 1972 right. Mm-hmm. right there so you know you've got vampires that are very reserved and very you know together in the tv series and then you got mm-hmm. a little more violence and a little more uh more hammer-esque right mm-hmm. in house of dark shadows where christopher lee who played dracula was always very he was very violent, even starting in the original Dracula, horror of Dracula, mm. you know, in 1958. Um, super, you know, aggressive and stuff like that, but still very composed, very regal, right? And so now you've got this, this dude uh, running around Las Vegas mm-hmm. that is like this, this monster. And I think that it helps that it's Matheson that brought this screenplay to life because Love Matheson. Mm-hmm. obviously with um the um the book no do you know the book that the the the, um i am legend right i am legend from yeah he wrote in the 50s i believe yep i am legend his vampires in i am legend are not traditional vampires right Mm -hmm. they're not you know those those traditional 19th century vampires you know yeah. that, that that led up to you know varney and dracula and all of that other stuff so i think that this does a really good job of combining the more traditional vampire uh with uh you know that i am legend vampire mm-hmm. and uh i right. think it makes it it makes it very realistic it makes it sort of brutal uh, he's mm-hmm. he's not so much a human being as he is a monster, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing about vampires is they all they could all be human beings. Like they interact with the general public most of the time. You mm-hmm. can see them walking around and they fit right in. This guy, there's something off about him, mm-hmm. right? He mm-hmm. doesn't fit in, and so that when he's walking through the casino, you know, as much as Dan Curtis may want people to look at him for being strange. <laughs> The people in the film, all the people in the film, all the actors looked at him, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, there was something off about him, like he mm-hmm. was kind of disturbing, right? Um, and so, then just going in and breaking into the hospital, taking the blood, you you think of like some sort of rabid animal, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's a total, and the fact that he doesn't speak mm. at all, right? Yeah. is a is a is sort of like this is this is not human right a little bit of michael myers uh yeah. action going on there not speaking yeah and so it's 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 really interesting it's a it's a really unique reinvention of the vampire taking you know what matheson wrote in his um book i am legend combining mm-hmm. it with the traditional vampires that we saw throughout the 19th and early 20th century uh, and and putting it in modern day Las Vegas, and I think it it works very well. I, I I really think that you know that sort of the Night Stalker helped move vampires forward and helped them progress yeah. forward to be mm-hmm. relatable to to audiences, um, in the 1970s. Yeah, I think vampires needed to go into a different direction in the 70s. You couldn't just yeah. have that same old, same old, like we needed something yeah. new. I wonder if when people sat down in front of their television sets on January 11th, did they all know it was a vampire movie? Like, I wonder how much like awareness they all had about the kind of film it was, if there was a lot of advertising in the days you before, know, I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure. I, there obviously had to be a significant amount of advertising. And I'm sure that, yeah. you know, with Dan Curtis producing it, there people had to know that there must be there. There should have been at least some sort of supernatural element in it, right? Um, and so I think that there, these were all big draws, um, and I think there was sort of a, a hankering for 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 filling the void on television for something mm. horror related, because yeah, you know, that's a good point. When Dark Shadows went off the air in 1971. Uh, you know, there there weren't a lot of, and then Hitchcock wasn't on the air or any air anymore. Mm. 
you know, uh, and so the the next thing that you had was Night Gallery. And Night, Night Gallery, Gallery started in in what year? Was it 19? Well, the film that Steven Spielberg directed a yeah. segment of with Joan Crawford, that was 69. Okay. I want to say that wasn't that the beginning of Night Gallery? Uh, yeah, was that? that? Yeah, that was the yeah. And so, it, so you had it Night aired Gallery. for a few years, right? Yeah, I think it went into like seasons. maybe 72 to three, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. So there there wasn't uh there wasn't a lot of horror on television at the mm -hmm. time. You know, the 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 closest you were getting was Night Gallery. Right. Um, so I think that that might have been a draw too. like, oh, well, this will be interesting. This is like we get to sit back. We get to enjoy a Dan Curtis production. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, but it takes place in a new setting. It's not, you know, the traditional, you know, Victorian small town type thing. It's 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 uh, Las Vegas. It's right. exciting and new. Yeah, it's cool. I, I can't imagine there was much airing on television that was set in Vegas that had a supernatural vibe to it, but felt yeah. very contemporary. That was probably pretty new for audiences in early yeah. 72. And that's and what I really enjoyed about it. Yeah. And the people liked it um, because the sequel got really great ratings too. Nice okay. Strangler in, in 73. So yeah. Um, yeah. I came really back for more. What I liked Brian's song, which we talked about in November is a very slow moving film. I mean, that's kind of different. It's like a sports film. It's a kind of a weepy, emotional tearjerker cancer story. So it's of, of course would have a slower pace than this, but I did like that in the first 10 minutes, we're not just sitting around like, like things are happening. There's like immediately we get that woman pulled off like the way from the sidewalk and attacked and I love the the choice of the opening credits to be of they're doing like the autopsy on her, right? Like they're cutting yeah. her open and I the know, camera is the camera is pointed upward. Yeah, it's a the, point of view at, from at, her. at their faces. Like yeah. it's almost like her point of view shot. Yeah. And that's what that's where the end that's where the opening credits go over. That I thought that was yeah. really clever. I was like, oh, that's kind of devilish way to open a TV movie that anyone could be watching from home. <laughs> like that was like that was a step beyond i like that a lot yeah i thought the pacing was really good like i felt I there so. wasn't there wasn't a scene that for me went on too long i mean there's maybe two or three scenes of big groups in a room and they're just talking i'm like yeah that for 74 minutes like maybe it, that those could have been shortened a little but overall i thought the movie had a pretty good pace to it although i would not consider it action-packed <laughs> but for you that a lot be... of movies brian yeah, There's a lot of act. You, you're all over the genres, and I stick, <laughs> I stick to them. If they, if they are in, if they're dark and gloomy, then I watch them. Right. Yeah. So the film had some yeah. style. I liked Kolchak a lot. I he was very likable. I I wasn't so on board with him taking photographs at every crime scene. I'm like, if he's a newspaper reporter, like that's his job too. He also takes the photos. I could just well, see. Yeah. <laughs> There's like, not uh, someone um, else that co comes with him on that. Oh like my he, God, Brian! No, do you think newspapers newspapers never had that kind of money? There's no. never a second person. You are in charge of writing the story and taking the yeah, photo. You have to. Yeah, absolutely. I just felt but, that it. it, it I, I may, mean, maybe he could have been like ten percent, like more intimidating. I thought when he's just like taking the photos everywhere, like it made him look a little weak at times. Like when I wanted him to be a little bit stronger. And what did you like, want him to do? I like get the fists like 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 clench his fists <laughs> get ready to attack <laughs> no because he's a journalist and <laughs> no I'm serious like as a journalist you can't inter interfere or intervene yeah no in no I know going on around you right so like uh he his job is to stand there and take pictures and he he took his job as a journalist very seriously well I mean when he goes in that house at the end and he's attacking back I just felt like we could have had a little bit more sign earlier in the movie where like like that sets up he's going to do that because mm -hmm. when he's just like taking photographs of but, his crime scene i'm like eh, but doesn't seem very strong the narrative is he's trying to get people to listen to him right mm -hmm. he's trying to do his job and doesn't he use They're the word vampire him... in a story that gets published like doesn't he actually say like vampire killer i think so yeah um and so the he's trying to do his job he's trying to relay to the government officials look, this mm. is the situation you have on your hands. Mm -hmm. My job is to document that and to share that information with the public. It's not to go in and to kill the vampire, right? Mm -hmm. But he is forced to because of their inaction and their inability to believe to take himself out of his position. And it's really when 
um, the vampire makes direct eye contact after the swimming pool scene with Kolchak oh, right. that we know that is the turning point in, in Kolchak's He's not a journalist anymore. He's not sitting on the sidelines anymore. He's not covering the story. He is now in the story. And the vampire kind of oh, marks okay. him with his eyes. And I thought that was very good directing and very good writing. Yeah. Because that shows a, a significant uh, change in, in the character. Yeah, so, so I, I apologize if I got that wrong about the photography thing. I was a journalist in high school and in part of my college days. And I remember I did a few stories where like I went somewhere to report on something and each time there were three or four times I did that. And I remember the photographer for the paper came with me. And while he was well, taking pictures, I was taking down notes of what I was seeing. I mean, like, it, I, that it, happened it, to I guess me. it depends. I guess it depends where you work. Right. Okay. Cause I feel like um, that'd be a lot. If you, if you're, if you're going to a crime scene to write, like write down what's happening and then to also be in charge of, of taking photos. Yeah. But like I a mean, lot. Well, there's, I mean, there's some papers have photo journalists, right? Right. And so they are the the people that are, you know, they go out, but like if my example, high school paper had a photographer on staff, why yeah. would this giant paper in Vegas not have one? <laughs> well, that's my question. On, it depends on what you're covering too, right? Okay. And so Kolchak being very low on the, the and it, this is nobody, nobody's helping him. He yeah, has to do it all it's, himself. It's, it's, it, well, it's the same thing in TV too. Like some stations, you have an actual photographer, you have a, a videographer, right? They go out with mm -hmm. the camera and the reporter. And then some stations, the reporter has to do it all. You know, they have to set up their own camera. Yeah. They have to do all of that other that stuff. That would right? make sense. And so mm -hmm. it just sort of depends on the assignment and stuff like that. And so Kolchak, this guy who's been fired at every single job that he's had previously, <laughs> Desperate he's been for all work. over the country, you know, yeah. he's trying to get back to New York, right? Yeah. He's trying to get back in the big leagues, but he's in, you know, what would then be pretty, you know, insignificant small town oh, okay. Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's gonna do what he has to do to make it big, and the newspaper is obviously, obviously not supporting him. But yeah, uh, the having to take your own pictures as uh, a journalist is is just par for the course. Yeah, and it, and it always has been, uh, except if you're at a, a larger outfit or you have a place that will have a photojournalist specifically assigned to to you to go out and and follow you. But you know people cost money so a lot of places just yeah but i think i think if he had been too strong if he had been like a big like muscle guy i don't think the movie would work as well i think you you have to feel afraid for him especially when he's entering the house at the end yeah. so i think that aspect to the character works really well yeah. a couple other scenes i really like i love that reveal of the pale vamp in the car like you just see like the, it's like what the nose to the forehead and it's pale and like really creepy and then we don't really yeah. see him as he's approaching that woman at the car like yep. That was one of the more effective, I thought, like scary scenes of the movie. Mm -hmm. I also really enjoyed the hospital scene. <laughs> the vampire was really great where all those people are getting attacked. I know. And, uh, That's what that, I'm talking about, this action, Brian. That was a good action, action moment of like yeah. that woman falls down and in like the same shot, you see that guy get thrown across the hallway and then the next guy gets thrown out the window and the window yeah. shatters and he goes flying. Like that was that was like a high level of action for that. Scene. And and this speaking of Dan Curtis, this is where some because Dan Curtis has these motifs that he does, too. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the foundation of his swimming pool motif mm -hmm. and his defenestration motif, which is, of course, throwing people out of windows. <laughs> does that happen in both the Dark Shadows movies? Someone goes out a window? No, no, no. This is this is the this is the kind of the foundation for that happening. Oh, this is the future start. Works. Oh, okay. Yeah, in his future works. Because <laughs> I I noticed this when I rewatched because I didn't the, the first time I, I saw uh the Night Stalker, I I didn't pay much attention. But you know, being more familiar with Curtis's work uh after Night Stalker now, I said, wow, there's the swimming pool. Yeah. And oh, there's the window. So I You gotta you know, love it, a scene where someone that goes out a window it's in texas chainsaw I mean, massacre right yeah. when she goes out the window at the end one of the greats is the long kiss good night when gina davis and samuel jackson jump out that window and she's got a gun and she fires at the ice below to break it up so they can land in the water <laughs> there's been some great ones so that that was a cool scene i like that scene yeah. in uh, night stalker uh and then we get to the house at the end anything before the house you wanted to touch on that we didn't mention before we get to the house and the, I do want to talk about the ending and how it's yeah. really interesting. The last five, six minutes of this is really interesting. So Anything I else think, before the house? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, going back to the previous thing before we get there, 
Uh, well, swimming pools actually played a big part in, in House and Night of Dark Shadows, too. Um, yeah, he has this thing for swimming pools. It's kind of interesting. I don't, I don't, and it's, it's just something I, I realized today. So thank you. Some for directors, it's like Stanley Kubrick always had to have a scene in a bathroom. Alfred Hitchcock had a lot of food scenes in his movies. Yeah. You know, it's a running, it's running. Th- Some directors just have a thing. Did you uh, know Quen- about Quentin Tarantino, a, a bare feet, right? Did you, did you ever listen to the interview with, with Hitchcock um, on the Dick Cavett show? I probably a long time ago. Does he talk about yeah. the use of food in his movies? Well, no, he's just talking about having a dinner party and he mm. made all the food blue. <laughs> You need okay. to listen. It is one of the I, it is one of my favorite interviews of all time, and it really speaks to the genius of this man, Alfred Hitchcock. He loved food. And he loved beyond food. the movies. His wife yes. Alma Revel loved cooking and was a great cook. And I read a biography on Alma recently that she, she like there's uh, recipes at the end of the book of like all the great food she would make for him and. Oh, <laughs> like she's yeah. like, she, like, like food was a big part of the Hitchcock clan that they love their food and their yeah. wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so Curtis likes people getting thrown out of windows. <laughs> yes. Actually, now I, I realize it's the swimming pool thing is a little more prominent, though. Now, Curtis didn't direct this movie. He produced no, he didn't. it. No, he didn't. He did he, not he direct directed it. the sequel. He directed he, the so, sequel. So, yeah. So Night Stalker was directed by John Llewellyn Moxie. Yeah. But the sequel, The Night Strangler, was directed by Curtis. So why did, do, you, do we know, why did Moxie not come back? Why did Curtis direct the TV movie sequel? I don't know. Uh, it was, I don't know. Uh, Maybe Moxie Sanders, was unavailable or something and yeah, Curtis said, I'll I mean, just do it. <laughs> I mean, could be, could be. Uh, you know, it might have been a money issue too. Okay. Um, so Because usually, you know, like someone at Curtis's level, usually someone like that, would direct the first movie and then they get someone else to direct the sequel. Usually it's not the yeah. other way around. Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe he had some, some other stuff going on at the time. Or, it'd be like, yeah, if really sure it'd be like happened. if some big director had made Jurassic park one and two, and then Spielberg directed Jurassic park three. Yeah. <laughs> it'd be but like, I, I, again, you know, Dan Curtis was, was not really a director until house of dark shadows. He, he was a producer. Right. I thought of him as we'll talk about the end. I thought of him as a producer, and then I looked him up on IMDb, and I'm like, oh no, he has a ton of directing credits, like going into the 80s and 90s. Yeah, and And so he made feature films. Yeah, yeah. So getting uh, his feet wet of directing, you know, his first film with House of Dark Shadows, but prior to that, he was just a a producer. Right. So that could be another reason for it. And then he wanted to, you know, try his hand at directing again for the sequel, so he did it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I like this. I'm going to do it again. Yeah. Because he directed Burnt Offerings, right? The 76 yes. film. He directed that. Yeah. Yes, he did. And that's a very famous horror film from the 70s. What we might get to in four years. I don't know. <laughs> four years. Number. I can't four believe we're years. getting to Burnt Offering in, in four Burnt years. It just offerings. doesn't seem like that. It's just this the time is going by so quickly. It's just crazy. it feels like it feels like we recorded our episode on House of Dark Shadows like three months ago. It's like that, that was a year and a half ago. And it feels like I was wearing <laughs> the same exact shirt. <laughs> I think so. I don't think much has changed in your end. I have a, I have a different backdrop and uh, I've definitely, yeah. I don't want to well, look back on the early episodes. I probably have aged a lot. I don't know. I have, I have this <laughs> just, just so the people at home, the viewing audience on, on YouTube knows um, <laughs> the, the heads are still on the shelf behind me. There's but, not as many. I feel like no, the no, first no, no, time no, no, it was a lot. No, no, no. no. There, there's the, the four heads, Christopher Lee, Bela Lugosi, Glenn Strange, the Frankenstein monster, and Lon Chaney Sr. is the Phantom. Still all reside on the shelf normally, but because Brian was complaining on the last episode that I didn't have anything new. I don't me, complain. When do I, decided, I complain? I decided to remove all of the heads and put other objects behind Oh, okay. No, yes. go crazy. I, I don't care. Yeah, including, including. Oh, you got a jack-o'-lantern. Well, it's a special one. It's for you, Brian. Very nice. Very Halloween. It is. It is. Even though we're recording this in mid-January, it's, it's Halloween, Halloween is still in our hearts. Well, it's the Halloween pumpkin. There it is. From Halloween. Like that's the one that's in the beginning, the opening credits. Like you got yeah. that pumpkin in your room? Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. This is the official prop replica of it. Oh, okay. A replica. Yeah. I thought you were saying it was the pumpkin. Hey, I would hope it wouldn't be that pumpkin. 
that'd be a pretty special pumpkin to make it almost it would, 50 years. I it would be well, it is a very special pumpkin, <laughs> but you know, I don't I don't think it's around anymore. All right, so let's let's get to the house and the ending of this film. The like we get what three or four minutes, maybe more of him just roaming through the house. And I loved all that. That was really cool. And you know that some something's gonna happen. And then he finds that girl tied up to the bed. Yeah. But then there's a vampire pulling up like right behind him and there's nowhere he can go. He has to hide in a closet, right? Yeah. And uh, the vampire finds him and a fight ensues. And I mean, the movie, it, it, it's, it's innovative in that it's taking vampire tropes and updating them to like a contemporary setting. But yeah. it's still, we still have like the sunlight hitting the vampire and the cross and the stake to the heart. Like, like what they do with the vampire at the end, it's all very much similar to what they would have done in the 30s. What I thought is, is being unusual about this is I noticed so many similarities between this film and Salem's Lot. Mm. And I never noticed them before. But I mean... Also a TV movie. They are extremely similar, right? Or maybe and, so. uh, Well, yeah. and <laughs> It's well, long. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it was a book by Stephen King first, right? Salem's so, Lot was a book by Stephen King. I you didn't, I didn't, you didn't know, know that. that. That's what. <laughs> yes, yes, listeners. I, I I knew that piece of information. <laughs> but but Stephen King was uh, a huge fan of Dark Shadows, uh, and it, it, oh, it that would very, make sense. Yeah, it was very influential in his writing. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm thinking about it, perhaps he watched The Night Stalker, and that was very influential for Salem's Lot. I would bet a lot of money. That yeah. that Stephen King watched The Night Stalker. So yeah. his first book, Carrie, came out in seventy four. I want to yeah. say I think he sold it in seventy two, and it came out in seventy four. Some something like that, maybe a little bit different. But and then I want to say so. Carrie was seventy four. Salem's Lot was seventy five or seventy six. So yeah, I think around this time he probably would have watched Night Stalker for sure. Yeah. I'd be surprised if he's like, "What's that?" I think he probably this probably influenced his writing on Salem's Lot. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, that is, and I just hit me today too. It just hit you today. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a lot of epiphanies today, like the yeah. swimming pool thing, the the Salem's Lot, uh, Night Stalker connection. Like King uh, King wrote a great nonfiction book called Dance Macabre. Have you read that? Yeah. Dance Macabre, and uh, it's all about the history of horror. I wonder if he talks about Night Stalker in that book. I read it like seven or eight years ago. I wonder if I were yeah, to I've, back well, I've been I've been meaning to read that book because he I've talks about a lot of like he talks about thriller. He talks about Twilight Zone. He talks about all the influences he had in the '60s. Yeah. And I think even the early '70s. So maybe he touches on Night Stalker in that. I'm not sure. Hey, that would be that would be interesting. I'd, but I'd, so yeah, I still we, have been meaning to look at it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I would definitely take a yeah. look at that. Like his. Like, obviously, we all love his fiction, but Dance Macabre and uh, On Writing are just phenomenal works of nonfiction that he wrote. But, um, yeah, so we get to the fight with the vampire. There's someone else shows up. Someone else is there who could help him at the end be like, yeah, the reason that they killed the vampire. (laughs) But he just stays quiet, right? He's like, just don't say anything. Just leave. Just get out of here. But uh, it's it's such a great moment. And then they finally corner the vampire. They get him down on the ground and he stakes him in the heart. We don't really see it. It's a TV movie. You're not going to see much gore or anything. But then right as he's doing it, the other the, the detectives, the group comes in and they see him killing this guy. And none of them believe it's a vampire. So we get this really cool scene at the end where he's, where Col- Coltac's feeling great. He's like, oh man, this byline, it's going to get me some work in New York or San Francisco. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to really coast along here to some better opportunities, but they want to arrest him for a murder. That's right. And there's a long scene of them talking back and forth. And Kolchak is, he can't believe it. He's like, what are you talking about? I, I just saved the community. Like I took this guy off the streets and you're going to tell, you're going to, you're going to arrest me for murder. And, and journalists, let this be a lesson to you. This is a reason (laughs) to never insert yourself into the story. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> because then you become the story yeah so um yeah it was a, a really i thought it was a really interesting ending i you knew know, that it, something bad was coming because yeah. he was so happy and he goes to see his boss and he's like you, you know you've done a great job for us and he's like huh by the way that boss he has in the movie that's the guy 
I, it took me like halfway through the movie. I'm like, where have I seen that actor? That's the actor at the end of Psycho, <laughs> who does like the long monologue about who Norman Bates is. Oh. Remember at the end of Psycho, there's yeah. that guy, and he's like, he has that classic moment where he goes, uh, "Yes and no." <laughs> or what's it? He, <laughs> he talked like never, I did not recognize the him. worst, wow. the yeah. worst part of Psycho, that long monologue at the end, where he's talking about transvestites and everything. And it's just like, yeah. okay, what? But uh, yeah. that's the, that's the same same guy in this movie. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Thank 12 you. Twelve years older <laughs> for sharing the connection. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah. So, and like, I was like, are they actually going to arrest him? No, they, they have created their own story, right? That's yeah. just, they're not going to call him a vampire. And then, they're, they're, but he has to leave town. He has to go or they will arrest him. So he leaves town and we see him at the end and we don't really know where he's going to go next. And that made me intrigued to see what the second one's about. Well, what was so fascinating to me about this, Brian, if I'm being honest, is if we look at 1972 and sort of the content you would see on television, mm-hmm you're not seeing a lot of political commentary mm-hmm. at this point, really not until all in the family sort of, you know, hits its strides that. Yep. That political premiered in 71. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, and you know, when it really sort of hits off, you know, it takes off in, you know, the mid seventies when everybody's like, really like the political commentary, this is like where television is going, but night stalker just grabs that mm-hmm. opportunity and it just runs with it. And yeah. It's so fascinating because that's the whole point. You know, Las Vegas is this tourist town and they don't want people thinking, you know, that there's actual vampires running around. And it, it, the whole political pressure that mm-hmm. you see in a horror film is really fascinating. And mm-hmm. I think that was a, a, an exceptional uh, component to the story. Yeah. And then, of course, in the end, you know, where political pressure will win out. Um over you know the guy that did the right thing i think that was that was a big takeaway and i think there's a lot of you know for being such a short film there's a lot of depth Mm -hmm. to a lot of the things that happen here yeah great arc to the character i think if the movie just ended with them killing the vampire and he turns in his story and he's got a smile on his face and roll credits i don't think i would have liked it as much i think the way it ends with his character made it more interesting yeah yeah so yeah, I really like this for a TV movie. I mean, obviously my favorite TV movie we've talked about on the podcast uh, is Duel, which I just think is a masterwork by Spielberg. But this was a lot of fun. I When I go into a TV movie, I'm like, eh, I don't have like high expectations. But Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson, I, that got me excited. And I really did. I enjoyed it a lot. And I'm glad I watched it. I'm excited to see the sequel and potentially even some of the episodes of the series. I just really like that character. I really love Darren McGavin as Coltax. Uh, and so I want to see more. Yeah. Coltrack <laughs> is a great guy. All right. That takes us to our final two segments. The first one is the divine double feature. That's where we pick a more modern film to pair with the movie we talked about on the podcast today. So it doesn't have to be a movie in the last five or 10 years, but is there something more recent that you would pair with the night stalker? Like what would be something cool to add on? I mean, it's only 75 minutes long, right? So what could we watch right after that's a little bit newer? The X-Files. The X-Files like- fight the future from 98. Sure. Or just the any, show. Any anything having to do with the X Files because they are such similar concepts. Um, oh, okay. And, and it's, it's, it's 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 you know it's it's this whole idea of the, this guy or the, these group of people that are you know supposed to accept you know mm-hmm. what is reality and then they stumble upon all of these things that aren't supposed to exist mm-hmm. right within our world. And obviously, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, a huge, uh, huge influence on the creation of the X Files and with everything we talked about earlier. So I think mm-hmm. it's just a, a pretty obvious pairing. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely like the 1998 movie more than the 20, the 2008 I Want to Believe film. Did you ever see the second one they did? They put out the theatrical film from 08. It was called I Want to Believe. That movie was not I good. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that movie was not good. But I, I love the series. I really enjoyed the 1998 movie. Yeah. And then I liked the the newer version that they did. Like recently yeah. they did yeah. two seasons, mm-hmm. I want to say. Two yeah. short seasons. Yeah. It wasn't perfect, but I, I had no. a good time with the new, yeah. the new version. So yeah, X-Files is a great choice. I went with something brand new that I just watched a few weeks ago. I was like, what's something in the last couple of years I've seen a horror film where there's a detective on the case and I was it, it wasn't a great movie 
I think it was one of the better installments of the last few years. And that was, uh, that was the Saw film I watched, Spiral with Chris Rock. It's uh, so there was obviously the Saw series. It ended at seven in 2010. And then there was a Jigsaw movie like three or four years ago. I don't know if I even saw that one. But then in 2021, there was a new version, a new installment of the, of the franchise with Chris Rock, Samuel L. Jackson, Max Minghella. It's a really great cast and some really brutal kills. I don't think you'd like it, John. No, <laughs> it's pretty. Not. It's pretty violent. But I had a good time with it. It was nice to be in that world again. It had been a while. So uh, I would recommend Spiral. It's also a horror film with a detective trying to solve a murder mystery. So uh, I would also, I think that'd be kind of an interesting uh, experiment to look at the horror genre over 50 years to see where it was in January of 72 and then where it was in May of 2021. Very, very different. Obviously there's, obviously there's a lot of, you know, shades of horror that we see in some movies aren't quite as violent, but they're they're doing more violent things in 2021 than they were in 72 you, you mean although you, you mean there's more action more action <laughs> yes i there is a lot of action in spiral but from 2021 i still would not call that action packed though oh god <laughs> it's just really gruesome <laughs> if you like if you like the saw movies like i really love the first three it's not in that it's not in the same league as the first three of the saw movies but it was pretty solid i liked it so I would, uh, I, I, I would say there is a film we will get to later this year for 72 that has a lot of violence and it's very hard to watch. And that's Wes Craven's Last House on the Left. It is coming, oh, yeah. Jonathan. We are just a few oh, months wow. away from Last House on the Left. That's going to be a fun episode. That'll be in the summer. Uh, so that takes us to our last segment, Beyond the Flick. That's where we talk about usually an actor or a director or a genre affiliated with our movie. Today, we're talking about a producer I'm in, a, in like the last year and a half, I'm trying to think, have I ever highlighted a producer of a movie? I don't think I have. This might be the first one. So Dan Curtis, why is this an important figure in the history of film, Jonathan? Well, I think that Dan Curtis did a lot specifically for horror films mm-hmm. and the horror genre. So starting with Dark Shadows in 1966, mm-hmm. You know, he he went from being this he he produced golf specials. Right? <laughs> everybody loves watching golf, um, and so he produced these these golf specials for TV. And yeah. uh, then then he decided, well, we're going to create a uh, uh, a a daily uh, serial, uh, a suspense drama, a weekday suspense drama is what it was billed as originally. The first of its kind, right? That was a daily yeah. soap opera with like horror yeah. elements, supernatural. Yep. But but it wasn't it wasn't uh, initially uh, set to be a a, a horror series at okay. all. It was it was just sort of uh, in sort of along the lines of Jane Eyre, you know, sort of mm. gothic, uh, with without supernatural elements and and people weren't really into it all that mm. much. Uh, it didn't it didn't have a huge sway with the general public. Um, but then they started bringing in ghosts. It was actually Dan Curtis's daughter that says. Well, why don't you add a ghost, Daddy? And uh, <laughs> nice. then he said, well, yeah, let's just go for it. Let's add a ghost. So they took Catherine Lee Scott, who played Maggie Evans, and they dressed her up in this big fluffy gown or whatever uh, with this, this uh, you know, lots of white uh, things spewing off of her. Mm-hmm. And uh, she just sort of danced around uh, the, the house itself. And uh, they had this really cool scene where she's stepping out of uh, the portrait of Josette and uh then from that point forward the supernatural was a huge part of dark Mm -hmm. shadows dan curtis was never intending to to make it big in the the horror genre at all and he sort of just accidentally fell into it Mm -hmm. and then before you know it barnabas collins arrives and then dark shadows becomes super popular dan curtis is making a variety of tv uh tv movies Mm -hmm. uh including the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde uh, in 1968, uh-huh. uh, co- to coincide with Dark Shadows, Dark Shadows, you know, obviously spawned uh, House of Dark Shadows in 1970, Night of Dark Shadows in 1971. Uh, then you get to the Night Stalker, um, which was uh, a, a huge success in 1972. Yep. Night Strangler, another great success in 1973. Trilogy of Terror was that 75? 
Trilogy of Terror was 75. Great segment with Karen Black. That's the part I always remember. Then Dan Curtis like little... trilogy. <laughs> yes, yeah. The, he the also Uni did. He also, all. I don't know if he directed or just produced, but was involved with TV movies in the 70s. He did Picture of Dorian Gray, one of my favorite yeah, horror Dorian stories. Gray. And Dracula from 74. Yes, Dracula. Have you seen Jack that? Collins. Have yes. you seen that version? Is that a good yeah. film? So I, I, you know, I, I like... Um, Bob Cobra does the music for for uh, for these ones too, mm-hmm. and I really I, there's this um, I I like the Dracula of uh, the Dan Curtis Dracula I think it's it, it's it's well done mm-hmm. because it, it 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 takes from Dark Shadows in that it it inserts the romance element the lost love type element mm-hmm. into the the Dracula story which is never really there but then of course when by the time you know coppola takes it on it's just like he just cements that is what that's Mm. what dracula is right but we owe all of that to dan curtis and we owe it to dark shadows and then his version of dracula which was heavily inspired by dark shadows right down to having a music box oh cool and and excited to watch that one yeah and he also directed uh, turn of the screw based on the henry james novella but uh turn of the screw let's see what year what year was turn of the screw it's 74 75 around there yeah and he, he originally did turn of the screw on dark shadows oh okay. uh, that was that was the story arc in uh 1969 mm-hmm. uh it was it was it was an adaptation of turn of the screw and it's one of my personal favorite storylines on dark it's, it's actually my my favorite storyline on dark mm-hmm. shadows it's not all that long it's uh in comparison to to most of the the run on dark shadows um but uh yeah it's 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 very well done I, I think the turn of the screw story is great. Have you seen the uh, the the second season of the Netflix, um, the Haunting? Yeah, the Haunting of Bly Manor of Bly was Manor. Turn of the yeah. Screw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Not I nearly as good. Really, not nearly I as good it, as I thought, uh, I thought, Hell House. I thought it, I thought it was really well done. I liked it. I, I liked it a lot. I liked the first episode. Uh, Flanagan directed the first episode, but then he was not. He didn't direct the rest of it, and you could feel it. Like he, like he directed uh, Midnight Mass. Did you see that on Netflix? Was so oh, good. And he it. directed. I think he wrote and directed the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he. I know he directed the whole thing. I can't remember if he wrote all the scripts, but uh, he just is just a phenomenal director. So I felt like you could feel his presence not in the remainder of the episodes on Blind Manor. It was still very solid. Yeah. I just I just prefer his work on Hill House, but. Uh, Taming of the Shrew is also a very important uh, adaptation with The Innocence in 1961 with Deborah Carr. Great movie. Oh, One of my favorite yeah. black and white horror films. Just really fantastic. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see what Dan Curtis did with it. Yeah. And you've seen that one too? No. Oh, okay. So I'd, I'd like to check that out. He directed Trilogy of Terror, Burnt Offerings. I guess he directed Trilogy of Terror 2 at some point. There's a second one. I didn't even know there was a second one. Did you know that? <laughs> I, I, it's apparently a sequel. But did you know, Jonathan, what he considered his finest achievement as a creative person, as a director? It was not Dark Shadows. It was not any of his horror films. It was uh, uh, War and Peace. War, the oh, Winds of War. Winds of War and War. It was two different peace. projects. The Winds yeah. of War and War and Remembrance. Yeah. Uh, they were not genre at all, but they were historical epics. Yeah. The latter film, the latter, I think it was a mini series for TV. Yeah. The mm-hmm. War and Remembrance won him an Emmy. He said upon his Emmy win, I'd like to thank ABC for ponying up the dough to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> which I which I love that quote. Yeah. He worked up until the end. He died in 2006, 20 days after his wife Norma yeah. passed away 20 days later. And as I said, he was, at least in some regards, working on that Night Stalker TV series from 05 to 06. And then he passed away in 06. So he was just, he was always working, producing, he directing. He directed some feature, f- like beyond Burnt Shadows. He made this- I, Burnt I, I, Shadows? I, I mean, Burnt, I'm sorry, Burnt Offerings. <laughs> burnt Shadows should have been a, a sequel to Burnt Offerings though. Yeah, and it could have like, it could have pulled in some of the Dark Shadows. Well, you know, there are characters named uh, David and Aunt Elizabeth. Oh, okay. in burnt offerings <laughs> but that i mean you were talking about how we could have had kolchak in the x-files like what if we had taken some characters from dark shadows 
and put them in like a burnt offering sequel or put the put them in like trilogy of terror or or a dracula adaptation been, it would have been cool to see him in, in like, trilogy of terror like how dracula been... showed up on buffy the vampire slayer yeah <laughs> yeah it could have happened it could have but uh it might yeah. still you never know but he did he didn't just do horror films like there's this 1993 movie that i looked up on imdb that looked really terrible but it was like it was like a family drama comedy with danny aiello called me and the kid (laughs) and it's directed by dan curtis i'm like interesting that i feel like he's so well known for horror films and vampire projects and, and dark shadows like it must have been hard for him to get out of that genre throughout the 70s he's really yeah, only doing but, horror films I, and tv movies and stuff i mean yeah but he did right with um winds of war and war yeah and it'd be like if it'd be like if, really yeah, big it'd be like if wes craven in the last decade of his career all of a sudden was directing and producing like band of brothers for hbo we'd be like what okay <laughs> like he, dan curtis was able to do that but he always went back to you know the gothic horror roots because he went back to dark shadows in 1991 right the, which that was uh, a, that was, was that a series or a tv so it movie? started off as a tv movie it's a tv movie it, it was it was it was it was promoted as a tv movie right and, but it became NBC a series it. but but then it was um it became a series okay um it was picked up as a series uh at nbc and then there was all sorts of and how many you know, episodes the, aired 12 uh, 12 the gulf, okay the, the gulf war interrupted the broadcast and so they were postponing you know the episodes until okay. overnight two in the morning and so there's a ratings uh ratings mess once the the, the war started because mm-hmm. you know things kept getting postponed and then he had a really difficult relationship with um nbc which was the the broadcast network that mm-hmm. that aired it um because one guy really really liked it Mm-hmm. And then I, th- I think he left or like he wasn't there anymore. And then the, the head of NBC or something uh, was just refused to, to do anything. You mm-hmm. know, there was this massive like this, you know, people don't write, don't have letter campaigns anymore. But there was this massive letter campaign saying, hey, you know, bring back Dark Shadows because it was really well done. Like mm-hmm. it was so well done. Yeah. Um, and it would have been really cool um, to see more than just those 12 yeah. episodes the 12 episodes in my opinion were really rushed okay like there was there was way too much content in those 12 episodes it's like the first uh 500 episodes of the series in 12 episodes in 12 episodes <laughs> now we're talking yeah yeah so that's like that's why i thought it was just it was way too rushed but it was picked up mid-season and so i think they wanted to get um they wanted to get as much in as they possibly could. So the 1991 series is not a sequel to the old show. It's like a remake of yeah, it's a remake. stories yeah. that they did yep. in the 60s. Okay, gotcha. So, you. well, it's actually a remake of House of Dark Shadows. Oh, okay. It is It is almost... With a, a brand new cast. Yes, with a brand new cast. It is almost, in, in some instances, shot for shot, line by line, a remake wow. of House of Dark Shadows. Okay, um, interesting. And, but it's very well done. Is it available to watch anywhere? The ninety one? Not, not no. anymore. Um, okay. Not streaming, but the, they do have a DVD set. Oh, there's uh, the DVD set. Okay. The DVD set was out for a number of years, um, but I don't think anybody has the rights to stream it right now. Oh, okay. MGM, MGM still owns it. Okay. Um, they own the rights to it. Well, I guess I think they were sold. MGM now. I think MGM yeah, was right. sold. I, I know that was a big Amazon? deal with. Uh, I think it was to Amazon because of James yeah. Bond. I think that was a big yeah. deal a few months ago. So maybe we'll see what maybe it'll get picked up by Amazon. Yeah. But Dan Curtis, what what a career! A lot of great films. A lot of films I have yet to get to. I'm excited to watch. Of course, we love you for Dark Shadows, and really impressed by your work on The Night Stalker, and excited to see the sequel for '73. So thank you, Jonathan, for being here today to talk well, once you, again Brian, about Dan me. Curtis and his work and uh, excited to have you on again. I'd love to talk about uh, the Dr. Five sequel with you. And in October of 72, there was a Christopher Lee Dracula movie. Oh, I think cool. it's called yeah, Dracula AD 1972, I think is the title of that. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I mean, if you ever want to 
branch out and do like a romantic comedy let me know but i think i like just doing horror films with you that's i think i like just doing horror films with you too brian (laughs) because i can say nice things about horror films but if you put a rom-com in front of me (laughs) i'm probably not going to say nice things and then i'm going to offend the people that like it so i like to stick to what i like yeah and then we don't have any problems (laughs) no controversial opinions (laughs) it was so much fun to talk about the night stalker with you on the season premiere episode for the 72 season a lot of great movies to come here uh what do you have anything you'd like to promote or tell our listeners where they can find you online no just stay away from me no. <laughs> so, i love being here on brian's show <laughs> so doc the dr five sequel came out in july of 72 so we'll do an episode somewhere around then i uh, would love to have you back and talk more vincent price in the in the months to come It'd be fun yes awesome thank you so much brian <laughs> yeah so thanks so much for being here jonathan thanks to all of you for listening you can find us online at film at we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also check out my new YouTube channel, Brian Rowe Video, where I talk about film history, Academy Awards history. Uh, new videos are growing up every week. So check that out at Brian Rowe Video on YouTube. And until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good. <laughs>